I can sing out of John Cup and sing. I can restrain my members. <laughs> I'm in love with Jesus. And he's in love with me. <laughs> no matter what circumstances may be, Jesus loves us. His love is unconditional. What do you say? Our love is conditional. You love me, I love you. But God is not that way. Even though he knows everything about me. He knows what I'm thinking. He knows where I'm going. But he still loves me all the same. That's good, isn't it? Yeah. We can let it all hang out. Yeah. This morning, I just want to share with you on the subject, the surrender of self. The surrender of self. The surrender of self. But before we get started, we want to bow our heads and we want to invite God's presence. Because without the Holy Spirit, the words are void. And it doesn't, they don't mean anything. But the Holy Spirit takes the word and makes them the living word of God. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we look to you in faith. Lord, you have promised that your word will not return unto your void. And Father, I claim that promise. And Lord, as I speak this morning, I pray that your word will move us to obedience and action. Fill me with that Holy Spirit. Speak, Lord, for we need to hear a word from you. We ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Let everybody say, Amen. Amen. The surrender of self. Do you judge yourself to be stronger in in the things of God that you have ever been before. Do you love Jesus more now than when you first met him? Is your faith stronger now than it was last year? I hope so because that is precisely the way it's supposed to be. You see, every day with Jesus should be sweeter than the day before. Every day. Each day should find us moving up in our experience with a deeper faith than we had the day before. With a deeper love. A deeper and sweeter trusting relationship than we had the moment before. For we should be cultivating and nurturing this relationship. We should be growing closer and closer to Jesus. We should have him above everything. Yeah. And like we sing the song, I'm in love with Jesus and he's in love with me. The song ought to mean something. It ought to change our behavior. Yeah. Yeah. Because we are in a relationship with Jesus and we don't want to do anything to bring shame and reproach upon his name. And yet I hope and pray no one is satisfied that God has finished his work of growth and sanctification in their life today. I don't know about you, but I'm not satisfied the way God has brought me from. I'm glad he has brought me from, and I'm happy that I'm not what I used to be. You see, these, you see, this very moment, God wants to lead us out deeper into the waters of surrender and consecration. It's like going to the beach, you know. Some beaches you go to, you go off and you just drop down into the water. But in the Bahamas, it's not like that. You can walk out on the beach, you can walk out in the water. As you walk out, you, you uh, go down a little bit deeper. Each time it goes down in degrees, there's not a big drop off. And so our relationship with Jesus ought to be that way. We ought to walk closer and closer to him. And the closer we get to him, the more we should love him. And the, and, and the worse we see ourselves knowing that there's nothing in us that is righteous. And so there are still victories to be, to be won. There are still battles to be fought. There are sins to be put away. And there is a drawing together that, that needs to be accomplished by us and by the Holy Spirit. And it needs to be done now in each one of our lives. Amen? Amen. You see, I read some place in the Spirit of Prophecy, Ellen White says that the reason for discord and disunion in the church is, be is, is, it is because of our relationship with Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. You see, if you cultivate your relationship with Jesus, it, it neutralizes everything. Yeah. Yeah. 
And that's the cross of the matter, is our relationship with Jesus. But for us to have a relationship with Jesus, we need to surrender self. Turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 6. I want to share some verses with you that God expects us to go. Romans chapter 6, what did I say? Romans, Romans chapter 6. We're going to look at verse 1 and verse 2 and 6 and 7. And I want to highlight a few verses here that we will be dealing with this afternoon. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. If you dare say amen. amen. The Bible says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And then verse 2 says, Certainly not. How shall we who die to sin live any longer in it? And then verses 6 and 7 says, Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, and verse 7 says, For he who has died has been freed from what, everybody? Sin. Sin. And then verse 11 says, Verse 11 says, like, Likewise you also. It says, Reckon yourselves to be what? Yes. Dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. And then verse 12 says, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. And then verse 18 tells us this, it says, having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. The surrender of self. Does God really mean what he says in these great promises here in these verses of the Bible? Promises for the struggling Christian, promises for you and promises for me. Verse one says, shall we continue in sin? Verse 2 says, certainly not, God forbid. Verse 2 says, we who died to sin. And then verse 6 says, we should no longer be slaves to sin. And then verse 7 lets us know we are free from sin. And then verse 11 says, dead indeed to sin. And then verse 12 says, do not let sin read. Do not let sin have supreme in your life. And then verse, verse 18 says, and being set free from sin. And so these verses are tell us that we are set free from sin. There's victory for the Christian. But in order for us to have victory, we must surrender self. I don't see anything confusing about any of these texts. Maybe there is some secret meaning or maybe some hidden reservations which might not apply literally to us in these promises. Could it be we are tempted to believe so be because of the almost certainty in every verse in these texts and every line there's a certainty in every one. The book of Romans describes the perfect what God wants to do in you and in me. He wants to sanctify us from our sin. So many people are afraid of the word perfect. People are afraid that God would ask them to do something that they are not willing to do. We need to understand that God will never do anything in our spiritual lives that we are not willing for him to do. You see, God gave each one of us a free will. God will never force the will. God will never pressure us into any actions to which we have not gained consent. So that's just God can't save me without me. God can't save you without you. Now we come face to face with the basic weakness which has led millions into discouragement and defeat. You see, some of us are not willing to give up the, 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 the passing the, or the pleasing blessings or the, or the passing pleasures of sin for a season. For Hebrews 11.25 says there is, there is pleasure in sin for a season. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. Uh, there is a certain shallow, there's a short-lived pleasure in sin. Get a, get a witness. Yeah. In every case, there must be a decision of the will to give up these temporary physical pleasures of sin for a season. We need to make an intentional decision. Until that choice is made, 
until that choice is acted upon, there can be no real victory over sin in the life of a Christian. Well, all right. And so the question comes to mind, are you willing right now to give up all your darling sins? Yeah. Are you prepared to accept all the results of a complete surrender to Jesus. The mortifying of every fleshy lust or evil. There are only two reasons for a person holding back a thing to gain the victory over sin. There are only two. Number one, either he's not willing to give up the enjoyment of the sin, or two, or he does not believe that God will give him the victory. Those are the only two reasons. You see, being willing is our problem. But seeing it done is God's part alone. Being willing is our problem, but seeing it done is God's problem. You see, God is faithful. Yes, if there's any shortcomings, it's on our behalf. We must be willing, but we, are, but we can never be able to do it. You see, our self is our greatest enemy. Self is the greatest enemy. So once we have, you see, once we have settled it with, with the old man of the flesh who seeks to rule over us, all, I said, all the victories will come. Every one of us has been given a powerful, personal weapon to use in fighting the self-nature. We have a weapon God has given all of us. The will is our only natural reserve weapon. Positively, everything depends on the right action of this resource. Everything. I believe the ultimate sin in the eyes of God, the final factor that will cause a soul to be lost is to deliberately say no to the will of God. You see, we become whatever we choose to be. We are not what we feel. We are not what we, we are not what we might do. We are not what we might say in a simple, impulsive moment of our life. We are what we will to be. We are what we will to be. We cannot always control our emotions, but we can control our will. You see, our feelings have nothing to do with the truth of God's word. It is not your feelings that make you a child of God. It is not your emotions that make you a child of God. It is, do, it is doing God's will. Amen. Have you ever had a headache or a back pain? Does that change the fact that God loves you? Does it change the truth that the seven days of Sabbath? Whether you feel good or bad, the truth remains precisely the same. Some people can feel great during a revival, but when the revival is finished, their faith hits rock bottom. It is a yo-yo effect, up and down, with everything, you see. Everything is tied to emotions, generated by circumstances. And so as a child of God, I'm here to tell you, you can't be, you can't allow emotions to dictate how you feel and what you do or where you go what you say. You can't allow circumstances to control your relationship with God or, or control how you react or do things. You see, we must rise up above the circumstances. We must recognize the fact that our will and God's will at some point must come to violent collision. You see, we want to do what we want to do, and God wants us to do what he wants to do. So at some point in our relationship, some point in our walk with God, there's going to be a collision. Yeah. Yeah. I remember as a boy, we would play this game, and we would walk on the seawall coming from school. And we walk at the seawall, and we would walk, walk, and the other guy would be on this side coming south, the other guy going north, and we would say, I'm not shifting any coats. I'm not shifting any coast. I'm not shifting any coast. And so we would walk and walk right into each other, and there would be a collision. You either going on the ground or you go in the water. 
And so the same thing happens at some point in our relationship. We're going to come on the collision course with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, because at some point we must surrender our will. Either we will let God have his way or we will choose our own way. And we, and when our will and God's will come into collision, most people are not willing to admit that the true cause behind the raging conflict, you see, they do not see the battle as primarily be, but primarily linked to the self-nature. You see, it is the will. Yeah. The will is the governing force of the mind. The will. After giving people Bible studies, I have listened to hundreds of reasons for people not going all the way with Jesus. Well. They come up with all kinds of excuses. And as you ask for a decision, they always say, I agree, I agree. But when it comes down to ask them to follow Jesus and keep the Sabbath and, and follow him in baptism and keep the commandments, there's always some excuse. It might be, well, I to work on the Sabbath, and well, uh, I, I don't want to give this up. I don't want to give pork up. I don't want to give, I don't want to give jewelry up. I don't want to give makeup and fingernail polish and all these other things. I don't want to give these things up, but that's not really the real issue. Yeah. The real issue is there's a collision with your will and God's will, and you're not willing to allow God to have his way in your life. That's the bottom line. We are on a course of collision, and when the collision comes, we are not willing to surrender yourself and allow God to have his way. So that's the problem. So it goes much deeper than the words they are talking. There's a basic nature problem behind their lack of commitment. They talk about branches and leaves when the real problem is the root. You know, so if you have a problem with a tree, you don't deal with the branches. You need to go to the root of the matter. You see, when you come right down to it, the bottom line is that God wants something that self is not willing to give up. Uh, they love something more than they love God. You know, be good at rationalizing things. We said, well, you know, God is not in with me with that case. No, he's not convicted me of that. But let me say this to you. There, let me be clear. There's only one reason why we don't give things up that affect our relationship with Jesus. And that is that we love something more than we love God. I don't care how you slice or how you cut. The bottom line is we love something more than we love God. I don't care how you dress up, I don't care how you word it, I don't care how you articulate it, but there is something we love more than we love God, and that's the bottom line. You can't change it. This is why Jesus made this strange statement in Matthew 16 24. Jesus says, if anyone, Jesus says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him do what? Deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Why didn't Jesus finish the sentence by spelling out the thing to be denied? Let him deny himself what? Let him deny himself drugs? Let him deny himself alcohol? Let him deny himself what? Tobacco? Let him deny himself what? Sabbath breaking? Let him de de deny himself Sunday keeping? Let him, desire, let him deny himself pride? No, just deny himself, period. Yeah. All of us have something we need to deny ourselves of. But the problem is that we don't want to deny ourselves anything. We want to come to Jesus on our own terms. When we come to him, we want to live on our own terms. We want to do what we want to do. We want to go where we want to go. And we don't want to surrender self to Jesus. And therefore, there's a conflict. And so therefore, we are not happy. Jesus knew. Jesus knew that self was behind every angry battle against the truth in itself. You see, once the victory is gained, all other victories will, will be won also. Thousands are outside the will of God and, and, and outside the church. Why? Because they are not willing to give up self. They are not willing to give up something that they love more than they love God. And thousands are in the church and are miserable because something in their life has been fighting the will of God for years. 
Some of us are in the church and are unhappy because something in our lives is fighting the will of God. So what am I trying to say is this. To be a true Christian requires a full surrender. To be happy, to be a happy Christian, you must surrender all to Jesus. Like the song says, all to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. You see, you can't be part of the world and then part of Jesus. And that's our problem, you see. We want to come to Jesus on our own terms, our, our own conditions. Jesus don't work that way. He says, not all that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of the Father. Jesus wants all or none. You either in or you are. You can't be on the fence. God wants commitment. He wants total commitment. Right. You can probably recall some time in your life that when your will came in conflict with God's will, when you had a head-on collision. I remember when I had a head-on collision with, with Jesus in my life. I remember when I attended Oakwood University to study the ministry. And I was studying the class, the gift of prophecy, studying about Ellen White. And, and each week, the pastor would say on the Mosley, he would say, you know, I've learned a long time ago that letting y'all write book reports don't do anything. He said, I've decided to do this. I've decided to let y'all choose a topic you will read and do research on and then just do the research and then come back and he would say, give me a gem. And that's me saying, give me something that really stood out to you. And this week, we decided that we would always take a poll. We would say, well, let's, let's read on meat and fish. And then so we decided that we were going to read on meat and fish. So he said, what I'd like you to do, go to the library and get six, read ten pages from six different books of Ellen White. And when I read what she said about meat and fish, I had a head on collision. And I ran over and I told my wife, that's it. I'm in. I said goodbye to the flesh pots of Egypt. And I cut cold turkey. As I surrendered the will in regards to diet. And that was it. And so there's some time in your relationship, there's going to come a point that you're going to have a head-on collision with Jesus. And you must surrender. You must give it all to him. Otherwise, you'll not be happy as a Christian. You'll never have peace in your life. That's why there's so many miserable people in the church. Because they want to live the way they want to live. They want to go where they want to go. They want to dress how they want to dress. When you're in the army, you dress the way the army wants you to dress. And so when you come to Jesus, you dress the way he wants you to dress. You, see, you walk the way he wants you to walk. You talk the way he wants you to talk. Why? Because you belong to him. You have surrendered self. You've given up all rights. You're not on the own by yourself. You are born. You are born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And so he owns me. So he has the right to tell me where to go. He has the right to tell me when to eat. He has the right to tell me what to eat. He has the right to tell me what to wear. He has the right to tell me what to say and how to say it. So when we say, let me give so and so a piece of my mind, yes, you can give them a piece of your mind. Because it's your mind. But if you are in Christ Jesus, and self has been dead and crucified, you don't have a mind to give. Because the Bible says, let this mind be in you, which is in Christ Jesus. And so we'll bring our thoughts into subjection. And so the Holy Spirit is now governing your, your thoughts process. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, good. yes, sir. But we are confused, and so we are miserable. Because we want to do what we want to do. We have refused to surrender self. So we must surrender. Jesus requires all. So we need to turn for our rebellion and end that titanic struggle. The old self nature. You see, hardened itself and resisted every effort to turn away from rebellion and sin. Under deep conviction, I wrestle, and under deep conviction, I agonize against the powers of the flesh. But I, but, 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 but I get, but I get beat every time when we try to do it. You see, what happens is that the old self-nature claims squatters' rights. Yeah. <laughs> you know, 
That's how it is, you know. So you've been, you see, the longer you take to come to Jesus, the more energy, the, the more weapons the devil have to fight against you. If you've been living for self for 50 years and you decide to come to Jesus, all of a sudden that old nature rise up and says, hey, 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 hey. you a Johnny come lately. I've been there 50 years doing what I want to do. Going where I want to go, saying what I want to say, watching what I want to watch on TV, talking what I want to talk, eating what I want to eat, doing everything I want, and you coming to say, hey, you want to put a hold on this? Can't do it on your own. You must surrender self. You must surrender and allow Jesus to reign supreme. Yes. That's right. That's the only way you'll have victory. Yes. Yes. You see. You must surrender that will. The battle is over. And then when that happens, the heart is flooded with victory. And you can sing the song, Victory is Mine. And so what happened to change the picture? Did I finally manage to drive back the devil? No. My battle was with self. And your battle is with self. And when you become willing, when I become willing, and when, and when you become willing and give, give, the, give me, God will give us the victory and God will give you the victory. And that's why you will clean the promise in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, 57, it says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the victory is not for you. You can't get it on your own. On your own. It says, thank God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. And so when you surrender, when you, when you give all to Jesus, you will have victory in your life. Amen. So it may sound foolish, but it is still true. Before we can have, we must give away. Before we can be full, we must be empty. Before we can live, we must die. And before you can have victory, you must surrender. Is trying the answer, we must face it that we fight an enemy who is stronger than we are. Right. We fight an enemy who is, who is smarter than we are. We fight an enemy who has, who has more experience than we have. We fight an enemy who's, who, who have been studying us for over 6,000 years. The Bible says he's sold up with wisdom. You ain't no match for the devil. You can't fight him, you can't even fool with him because the devil will call on you. He will date, break you, lead you in the alley of compromise. Yeah. And that's what the devil wants to do. He wants to date, break you, he wants you to compromise your faith, and then he's high fiving with his angels. And Jesus is weeping. And he throws it in Jesus' face. He says they are not worthy. So in the weakness of the flesh, we find ourselves bound in mind and body by the superior strength of our spiritual enemy. We struggle to rid ourselves from this bondage, but the harder we try, the deeper we sink into this quiet now. At last, when we are totally exhausted from the effort, a friend comes by and says, I know what the problem is. You need to try a little harder. Well, listen to me. If that is the only answer we have to the sin problem, we might as well throw in the towel. You know when, when boxers are fighting, the other fighter can't defend himself, the man who throws in the towel? Yeah. So if that's all we have to do is to try harder, you might as well throw in the towel. That's not, you can't fight the devil that way. Do you know why trying will not break the chain of sin? Because sinful propensities are deeply rooted in the very nature of every baby born into the world. We are born and shaped in iniquity. We are brought into this life with inherited weaknesses which, which predispose us toward disobedience. Not one human being except Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, has been born with a converted, sanctified nature. That's why Romans 3.23 says, all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Notice it did not say all is sinning. Yes, yes. It says all have sinned. You see, God wants to give us victory. Yes. All, have, all of us have struggled with memories of failure and compromise. Sometimes memories come into my mind, I have to shake my head because they are, they are not holy things that comes in. And we can't really control those thoughts, can we? You can't blot them out. 
They are unfaithful for us, but you can't even control them. Every such effort has ended in defeat. You can't do it. But you, you see, we have...